I'm Ken Sanders. This is Ammo Can Library. Um, I've spent a lifetime in the world of books. I don't recall a time when I didn't read books. Even as a very young child, I always read books. Um, my ammo cans I brought with me tonight are from camping and river trips over the past 40 decades. And I've distilled, I've distilled some of my favorite writings over my entire lifetime into these, these two ammo cans you, you see here tonight. So this is the first installment of who knows what many episodes of the Ammo Can Library. I've been very, very privileged to go along with all of these books that I've read and, and stuffed into these ammo cans. I normally take better care of my books than the ones in here, but these have seen a lot of white water and a lot of rapids and a hell of a lot of sand. Uh, darkness too. Um, I've, I've also had the pleasure of meeting a lot of the authors. There's many, many authors I've met along the trail that have had huge influences on my life from our own Terry Tempest Williams to the late Edward Abbey to the late Charles Bowden and to the, to the still living and great Wendell Berry. And tonight we're just going to start with Chuck Bowden and see where we, we end up. Um, Chuck pu published some two dozen books during his lifetime from uh, Killing the Hidden Waters back in the 1970s and despite his death from a heart attack and died in his sleep six, almost six years ago this summer, uh, he's still putting them out there. He's so far published three or four books posthumously. Uh, they began with uh, uh, Charles Bowden, The Red Caddy, which is uh, into the Unknown with Edward Abbey. Uh, Chuck and Ed were, were friends as well. And this is his meditation on his late friend uh, Ed Abbey. Uh, a year or so ago, Dakota, The Return of the Future came out. Uh, this book is one of the most personal books. It's about Chuck's own ancestors, his own family, and himself, and it's one of the few writings he's ever, ever done on, on those subjects. Um, and it's absolutely brilliant. Let me, let me just give you a little taste here. <laughs> on a bend, I will see it, a piece of ground off to the side. I will know the feel of this place. The leaves stir slowly on the trees, Dry air smells like dust. Birds dart and the trails are made by beasts living free. The stars do not complain. They live, explode, die, and send no messages of regret. The wind seldom blows at this place and the days are almost sunny. I've never laid eyes on it, but I know it's there. There has never been a moment's doubt about its existence. The place is as solid as rock in my mind. I have never belonged to a place or a movement or belief, but still I look. On a bend, I will see it. Those first 10,000 years of my life I will try to explain how I stumbled to the ground and never got up. I know you didn't ask, but I did. I live in a time when nations harden into fossils and humans retreat into memoirs. I have never belonged to my time. I could go on and on and on. The book is absolutely brilliant. It's stream of consciousness, like an awful lot of Chuck's writing is. Um, but we move on. Now, understand, this small category are books published posthumously. You name me another dead author that writes as many goddamn new books as Chuck Bowden, and they're good. This isn't dredging up something Harper Lee never wrote in the first place. Jericho. A little biblical, I would say, don't you think? He 
these books are so powerful. This isn't just leavings they found in a dead man's estate. These are, these are really, really real books. Um, this is, that this comes from not being prepared. We're doing this completely spontaneously. The Jericho Road. The facts do not matter. A man is gone. David Hartley, his wife says, the man is dead. David Hartley becomes a matter of legend, and this legend erases David Hartley and erases me. There are reports of violence spilling across the border. Politicians insist that the border must be secured because American lives are at risk. I see things differently. The dead are Mexicans. The frightened are Americans. The violence is a tidal wave sweeping all before it, and it rolls south and murders Mexico. Monsters are called for, but the land refuses to provide them. They must be invented, and American history is a series of self-created monsters. Perhaps the nation's greatest folk art there was in the beginning the wilderness where Satan lurked and where the city on the hill could be toppled by demons spewing from the forest. There were the dreaded savages, also lost to Satan, who must die so that God and the godly might live. There were bestial blacks who might rise up in rebellion against their enslavement and people who thought it was obvious God intended them to work in the fields to be under the dominion of white men. There was, of course, demon rum, demon rum, and even worse, after the Civil War came socialists and anarchists and the yellow peril and then unions and then communists and then terrorists and their offspring, illegal immigrants. The land groan, groans under the weight of its monsters. There is the fear of childhood in the night, the dream of drowning, the nightmare of execution, monsters that come from with, within us and shove our personal wars into the face of the world. And the terror comes not from the question of violence spilling across the border, it comes from that word, border. Borders must be gone. I will have none of them. The line between me and the fly buzzing around my head, this line must cease. This is when I begin walking the Jericho Road. And one, one, one last one to tie it all together, ha ha. This is from an extraordinary work, Dreamland. I don't know what to call it. It features Charles Bowden's writings with these intense pieces of artwork from the genius mind of uh, Alice Leora uh, Briggs. They're just, it's an extraordinary marriage of words and pictures. Sometimes I hear this chant in my head, the mere beginning of a song that someday will be on everyone's lips. No one is illegal, but we are all criminals. The first line will be chanted by children, the second by adults. Since we all truly are human and we all truly have human rights and since we all truly help to kill the planet, the skies, the soils, the seas, the giant fish of the vast deep, we are all guilty and when some bestial court is finally called to order, we will all be convicted. Amen. The house of death, a fragment for the indictment, the millions moving north through the dust to escape doom. One more fragment. The drugs flowing north like a river of joy. Yes, add that to the indictment. But these are all the little charges dancing around the big charge, planet murder. That's just a little sampling 
little taste from the mind and the pen of the late, great Charles Bowden, friend of mine. Well, that's it for this episode of the Ammo Can Library with Ken Sanders. Uh, oh, I guess I should have cleaned the sand out first. We're going to put them all back. Goodbye, Wendell Berry, Mark Twain, Leslie Marmon Silco. Oh, nothing like some Robert Service on a river trip. Ed Abbey, Batchel Lindsay. Oh, that's a good one. Everett Roos, he, he goes everywhere I go, that's for sure. Some people care about finding him, not me. Wendell Berry, the most important living writer in America, and a book you never had of that we're going to scare the crap out of with you some evening around the campfire. Uh, whatever the hell it's called. We'll, we'll get to it. Wendell Berry. I spent a lifetime trying to study Gertrude Stein. I think this is the coda. I think I've cracked Gertrude Stein. We'll get around to her. Of course, Vaughn Short, the Robert Service of the Canyon Country. Oh boy, do I ever not get tired of reading his magnus opus, uh, Floyd's Void. And I think some of you out there know what I mean. The rest will terrorize you. This is saying goodbye to another, another time, to another episode. Keep your powder dry and your books in your ammo can library.